ladies and gentlemen. My name is Malcolm Wallace. I'm chairing this session uh, to be presented by Professor Martin Davies. Uh, with a touch of irony, it seems we're in the inner Oceania room to talk about maritime arbitration in the early 21st century. And with even more irony, uh, apparently we're going to hear about more lawyers but less law. Uh, as a member of the bar, I'm intrigued about this. And give the floor to Professor Davies, uh, who was taught uh, very nearly everywhere, it seems to me, on uh, maritime law, apart from New Zealand, but got close uh, on a number of cases in Australia. So, uh, welcome, Professor Davies. Thank you. I should start, I realise um, that uh, not everybody in the audience, or all five of you, are maritime lawyers. Um, so I, um, uh, I, I'm going to start with a little bit of an outline of what I'm going to cover. Um, uh, maritime arbitration is very common. Arbitration is a very common means of dispute resolution of maritime disputes, but only um, in the, well, mainly in the bulk trades, in what are called liner trades, um, which is uh, principally the carriage of containerized goods. Um, the, there is uh, a great inequality of bargaining power between the carrier and the owners of the cargo. And bills of lading typically have dispute resolution clauses that say, you have to sue me, the carrier, at a place that's convenient for me, my you know, Korea or uh, Japan if you're a Japanese carrier. So that in the line of trade, they tend to be choice of court clauses in the carrier's place of business. In the bulk trades, charter party disputes um, of large uh, quantities of cargo, wheat, iron ore, oil, whatever it is, there's much more equality of bargaining power. And the standard form charter parties uh, have dispute resolution clauses that typically provide for arbitration. So arbitration of charter party disputes is very common. Um, in fact, pretty much ubiquitous, which is a point to which I'll be returning later on. Um, so the outline. Um, uh, is that maritime arbitration, particularly in New York and London, which are the two centers of maritime arbitration, is increasingly dominated by lawyers, um, both as arbitrators and in argument before the panel. And that's a relatively recent development, um, the, the, the more lawyers part. Um, uh, and in both uh, the UK and in, in the United States, judicial review of arbitrators' awards is becoming increasingly restricted. We heard uh, about that, uh, well, at least the session that I was in this morning, about judicial review. Uh, which means more autonomy um, of arbitral decisions, uh, which is generally regarded as a good thing, at least in the arbitration community it is. Uh, but this means less scope for the development of precedent. And there is actually some concern in London at the moment that the restrictions on judicial review are stultifying the development of the law. Um, uh, finding the balance between autonomy and reviewability is, you know, that's, a, that's an important balance to, uh, to draw. Uh, both London and New York are in some degree of flux at the moment. Um, and as I'll try to illustrate to you, um, the, the real difficulty that there is in getting judicial review of arbitral awards in New York um, illustrates uh, some of the problems of having too much autonomy. You end up with lots of lawyers, but not very much law. Um, so that's the outline of my talk. Um, I'll say a little about um, maritime arbitration in Australia and New Zealand, because the Maritime Law Association of Australia and New Zealand has a panel of arbitrators. And despite their best efforts, and uh, best efforts of other regional centres like Singapore, uh, maritime arbitration is still predominantly London and New York, and increasingly shifting from New York to London. Luca, take a seat. Thank you. OK, maritime arbitrators in London. This is a quotation. Um, from a, a, a public lecture at my law school, the Tulane Law School, um, from uh, Bruce Harris, who's a very, very experienced maritime arbitrator in London. Uh, he's not legally qualified himself, but he's done literally thousands of arbitrations. And this is what Bruce said uh, in 2008. Even once the LMAA was formed, the LMAA being the London Maritime Arbitrators Association, even once the LMAA was formed in 1960, its membership was almost entirely made up of brokers and others directly involved in day-to-day -day shipping activities. Nowadays, though, all that has changed. Today's maritime arbitrators, or at least those who do the majority of the work in London, are mainly people, sadly only men, in fact, who have a legal background. A couple have worked in law firms, at least one has practiced as a barrister, and a number have worked in P&I clubs, usually after obtaining a practicing certificate as a lawyer. P&I clubs are the 
uh, liability insurance insurance. This is a phenomenon that is often the subject of complaint. There are not, we are told, enough truly commercial arbitrators. We need more people from the industry, not lawyers. So uh, in the, since 1960, um, the, the, the atmosphere, if you like, of uh, maritime arbitration in London is, in, is increasingly loyally. Um, uh, as Bruce said, um, both uh, as arbitrators and bef appearing before arbitrators. Now, the position is very different in New York. Um, it's still quite common in the old-fashioned uh, uh, standard form charter parties for there to be reference to arbitration by three commercial men. And you, see, you, st you still see this clause, um, which is fairly remarkable. But in fact, they are men um, in New York. There are 66 uh, members of the SMA Society of Maritime Arbitrators. 66 members of the SMA, two of them are women. Um, so they are still men. And remarkably, uh, uh, experience as a maritime lawyer does not qualify you uh, for membership of the SMA. You, can, you could have had a sort of 40-year career in maritime law practice, and you cannot sit as an arbitrator in New York. Um, this is uh, uh, illustrated in this case, a decision of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in uh, uh, 1994, W.K. Webster and American President Lines, where the enforcement of an award was challenged on the basis that one of the panel was a lawyer. So this was a, this was a basis for, for a challenge to the award that one of the lawyers actually knew, uh, sorry, one of the arbitrators actually knew about the law. Um, uh, and uh, the court said uh, that to be, to be qualified um, as an SMA arbitrator under this commercial men's standard, um, the person must have substantial, practical, commercial, non-legal experience. Now, in the end, that award was enforced because the challenged arbitrator had had uh, a long period uh, as uh, claims handling in a marine insurer. So because he had had uh, practical experience as well as legal experience, it wasn't held against him that he actually was legally qualified. Uh, um, now, the SMA rules um, now sort of reflect this position by saying members have to have been in a responsible commercial position for at least 10 years um, in order to, to, uh, to be qualified to be a, 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 an SMA arbitrator. The result is that of the SMA members, only 13 of the 66 members have law degrees. And so the position that is, is, was Bruce Harris describes as being bemoaned in London, that they're not, they're not commercial people um, as arbitrators anymore, is, is still sort of enforced in uh, New York because of the rules um, of membership of the SMA. So they are commercial people, the arbitrators are, still uh, principally, almost entirely, um, lawyers arguing before them. Now one consequence of this rule, um, the diminution in the size of the American shipping business and the, the offshoring, as they call it, of uh, the American shipping business, uh, means that this commercial men requirement uh, has created a dwindling, aging pool. Um, and of, uh, of that pool of 66, 34 of the 66 members are over 70 years old. Um, nine of them are over 80 years old. Um, and one consequence of this, 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 this requirement that many people cannot satisfy is that the business is increasingly switching from New York to London. Um, the business of maritime arbitration, that is. And I think that if the SMA doesn't change its rules pretty soon, there isn't going to be anybody left, and there isn't going to be any business left uh, in New York. Okay, so that's the position with maritime arbitrators in New York. Just in passing, I'll talk about the, the, the equivalent uh, statistics here in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, I lump them together because it's a Maritime Law Association of Australia and New Zealand panel. Uh, there are 29 people on that panel, um, almost half as many as in New York, uh, with much less uh, business uh, to go around among them. 26 of those 29 have legal qualifications, uh, so it's almost entirely made up of lawyers. Uh, only four have industry experience, um, so only four would satisfy that New York criterion of having worked in the business. There are only three women um, and only three New Zealanders on that panel. Okay, now more lawyering. Um, here's Bruce Harris again, and uh, you know, forgive me for these great long quotes from Bruce Harris, but I mean, Bruce is sort of right in the middle of all of this, and I thought this was an excellent technique lecture. 
Nowadays, solicitors on behalf of the parties handle most London maritime arbitrations, and those solicitors often employ barristers in addition. That, I believe, has come about partly because of the increasing complexity of the matters, but it's also because at some point in, I think, the 1970s, ship owners and charters and their brokers decided not to replace a whole generation of internal insurance and claims managers who had, until that time, run the majority of arbitrations on behalf of their principals. Around the same time, the P&I clubs who have been assisting ship owners in particular by running some arbitrations for, for them started to firm work, farm work out to solicitors. So around the same time that the makeup of the, the panels became more loyally in London, so did the representation before the panels. And the same is very much true in New York, although of course the arbitrators are not lawyers in New York. The argument before them is increasingly uh, dominated by lawyers, which was not always the case, as you can tell from Bruce's comments, and from the fact that there is a commercial men requirement um, in New York. Uh, it was intended to be principally you know, arguments about commercial realities. More lawyers um, all around. Now, less law. Um, more lawyers uh, means that you have more legal argument for the Arbitral Tribunal, obviously enough. Um, and the awards are increasingly, therefore, based on interpretation of the law. And that's particularly true in London, where the arbitrators are lawyers, and there's legal argument being made to them. The awards are increasingly based on interpretation of the law, but yet they have no precedential effect. Um, uh, arbitrators may refer to previous arbitral decisions, and there's quite a common practice of that in New York, where the arbitral awards are, are published. Um, they're reported, and you can read them on Lexis or Westlaw. Isn't Lexis one of the sponsors? You can read them on Lexis, right? Um, <laughs> I read them on Westlaw, actually. Um, uh, and so the arbitrators in New York do refer to previous arbitral decisions, but of course they, they don't have to. There's no binding effect um, of uh, previous arbitral awards. And so the question is, well, what possibility is there for judicial review? Um, judicial review of an arbitral award, both to correct errors of law, if the panel has made errors of law, which, with all due respect to them, is, of course, entirely possible in New York, given that they're not qualified lawyers. Um, and also to develop legal principles that do have precedential effect. Um, unless some cases go to court, there will, you know, there's no decision making that uh, to develop the law. So the question is, in the sort of rather larger second part of this presentation, is, well, how, what possibility is there for judicial review and development of the law? And the answer is, in London, there's some uh, possibility of judicial review. Uh, one of the questions that's being asked in London at the moment is, is there enough? Um, some, but not enough, question mark. In New York, there's almost none. There's almost no possibility for judicial review of arbitral awards uh, in the United States. And in Australia and New Zealand, um, I think uh, there's possibly even less um, than there is in New York. Um, and uh, so then there's a, I'll deal with an ancillary question of what scope is there for expanding or reducing the grounds for judicial review by agreement, which was something that was touched on in one of the sessions this morning. Uh, well, I'll take you through the three areas, three eras of judicial review in London. Uh, the first period, um, and I guess for the lawyers, it's a kind of golden age, um, was uh, under the Arbitration Act of 1950. Um, uh, and under the 1950 uh, UK Act, it was possible to state a special case for the commercial court on any issue of law, right? which meant that there was virtually unlimited right of appeal to the court on points of law um, in an arbitral award. You could just, you could go uh, freely. Um, this all began to change in 1979. The Arbitration Act of 1979 made judicial review much more difficult to obtain. Um, it was, importantly, it, was, it became discretionary only with the leave of the court. Uh, the criteria for review uh, was set out in a decision of the House of Lords called the NEMA in 1981. Um, the criteria are in my written paper if you want to look at them. I'm not going to take you through them now. Um, uh, in 1996, the act, another act was passed, the Arbitration Act of 1996, and in the uh, judicial review section is section 69, and among other things, what it does is to put the uh, NEMA-like, uh, I think restrictions there, that's a kind of Freudian slip, it should be criteria, um, 
they are pretty restrictive criteria, but I, I, I don't think that's the, quite the right word. They're now in the statute. They weren't before. They've been sort of codified in the statute. And uh, uh, <clears throat> the court will only give leave to appeal um, against an award if the award was obviously wrong. Obviously wrong is the standard. Um, now, a couple of decisions about the uh, effect of Section 69, important cases uh, exploring the, the, you know, the, the scope of Section 69, the judicial review section. First of all, this case, Demco Investments, a decision of Justice Cook, saying that there can be no appeal to the court on findings of fact, or that the evidence did not support the tribunal's findings of fact. Now, the latter can sometimes be dressed up as a question of law, um, that there was not sufficient evidence to support the tribunal's findings of fact. <coughs> You can't get review of that um, in, in the UK. Uh, this wonderfully named uh, uh, case, Braze of Doom, Wind Farm. I like to think of Braze of Doom, Wind Farm. That's like I do my fake Scottish accent. Um, uh, dealing with the obviously wrong standard. Um, and I quite like this quotation. To be obviously wrong, the decision must first be wrong, um, at least in the eyes of the judge giving lead. However, any judge of any competence, having come to the view that it is wrong, will often form the view that the decision is obviously wrong. <laughs> it's not necessarily so, however, as the judge may recognize that his or her view is one reached just on balance, and one with which respectable intellects might well disagree. In those circumstances, the decision is wrong, but not necessarily obviously so. So, and although that's quite amusing, I mean, it is actually stating quite a high, quite a high hurdle there. It's not just that I think the arbitrator's got it wrong. I think they got it really wrong, but um, is, is what the judge has to say to himself or herself before granting, granting leave. So a mere error of law um, is not sufficient to get a judicial review in London. And as we'll see, neither is it in New York. Um, it also has to be, uh, the judge has to give leave on the basis that the question is one of general importance. <coughs> And uh, in this case, CGU International Insurance, uh, the Court of Appeal, the English Court of Appeal, held that it has no power to give leave to an appeal unless there was unfairness in the process by which the judge came to the decision about leave. Now again, just to clarify this, what this means is that if the Court of Appeal thinks that this is a question of general public importance, but the judge didn't, the judge refused to give leave, because saying this is not a question of general public importance. The Court of Appeal disagrees. It can't allow an appeal from the refusal to give leave. Um, in other words, the Court of Appeal has no power to give leave merely because it thinks it's a question of general importance. It's only if the, the, the judge hearing um, the application for leave made some kind of procedural mistake. Only in those circumstances can the Court of Appeal review uh, the refusal to, to give leave. Um, so, those three decisions, there are obviously plenty of others, but I, I, I show you those to show you that judicial review is now actually quite difficult to get in London. Um, some statistics. The Mans Committee, I'll explain what the Mans Committee is in a moment. It's a, it's a committee set up by the Commercial Court Users uh, Committee um, to review whether Section 69 has, is too restrictive. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about it at the moment. But, um, its first interim report uh, contains some rather interesting statistics about those three eras of judicial review. In 1978, in that first era of effectively unrestricted uh, 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 appeal to court, um, 300 special cases were set down for hearing in the commercial court. Special cases being the me method by which you could get um, review of an arbitral award. Um, there were no reliable statistics about how many of them are maritime uh, awards, uh, but the Mans Committee estimates that 175 maritime awards um, were, were made subject to review in the single year of 1978. Now, in the 10 years between 1968 and 1978, 107 special cases for maritime awards were reported in the Lloyd's Law Reports. Um, so which meant that it's making a substantial body of maritime law that's being reported in the Lloyd's Law Reports, which are the specialist reports that deal with maritime cases, not only maritime cases. And so that meant that there were 9.7 reported special cases per year for maritime awards. 57 cases in that period went to the Court of Appeal, 10 to the House of Lords, which was then the highest court. So you're getting a substantial flow of maritime cases to the higher appellate courts, who are, of course, making maritime law. 
1990, um, in the second era, there were 39 applications um, for judicial review of maritime awards. 2008, about the same number, of course, 18 years later, you might expect there to be more business. 41 applications for judicial review of maritime award. Leave was granted in only 14 of them, uh, and only six were successfully challenged. So if you compare these periods, 14 uh, cases in the year 2008, 175 in 1978. Um, now, as I said at the beginning, finding the balance between autonomy and uh, reviewability is a difficult one. And maybe um, you might think this is, um, this is too much review, um, but some people in London are concerned that this is too little review. Too little. Um, uh, which is my not enough law question. Um, at the ICMA conference, the International Congress of Maritime Arbitrators, I always forget what the C stands for, International Congress of Maritime Arbitrators met in London in 2004. They travel around the world to nice places. ECMA 15 in uh, 2004, Robert Finch gave the sort of keynote address, the, Rob, the Cedric Barclay Memorial Lecture, and he said um, there is a real concern that the present day restrictive system of appeals from arbitration is having a stultifying effect on the development of English commercial law, and there is a danger that if this situation persists, it may do long term damage. Um, now that's a, that's a it's kind of in-your-face statement. Um, for, he's the former Lord Mayor of London um, at the Maritime Arbitrators Conference. Um, and indeed, this, this concern about the stultifying effect on English uh, law uh, led the Commercial Court Users Committee to ask Lord Mance to chair a working group uh, to review the impact of Section 69, this more restrictive uh, basis for judicial review. And in particular, uh, whether there's any case for making access to court easier in the limited area of maritime law. Because English law is very important to worldwide maritime law. It's used an awful lot in charter parties. And there is this concern that if the courts stop making maritime law, then, um, then what are we going to do? Um, now, in the United States, uh, the, grounds are ex the ground for review is extremely uh, difficult to achieve. Um, the FAA is the Federal Arbitration Act, and it's codified in 9 U.S.C. USC the U.S. Code, uh, Section 10, and it lists um, limited procedural grounds for review, fraud, corruption, evident partiality, exceeding the arbitrator's powers, etc. The only possible basis for review on the merits of the award, um, or for error of law, um, are... Um, is a judge-made ground, uh, manifest disregard of the law. Now, I'll take a little digression to talk a little bit about manifest disregard. There's much more about this in the written paper, should you wish to read it, which I imagine you probably don't. Um, but uh, as a result of something that was said in the Supreme Court of the United States, in a case called Hall Street in Mattel, it's now questionable whether this ground exists at all, uh, the manifest disregard of the law. Because this is a judge-made... Um, of ground for review. It doesn't appear in the Federal Arbitration Act. And in Hall Street and Mattel, the Supreme Court said, well, you can't, the, 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 the act is the law about um, judicial review. And uh, some circuits after Hall Street and Mattel have said, well, that means there is now, the Supreme Court has said there is no possibility of review for manifest disregard of the law. Others have interpreted Hall Street differently. Importantly, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals says that manifest disregard does still exist. Um, and, uh, which is important because New York is in the Second Circuit. So this, uh, at least until the Supreme Court clearly says that there is no review for manifest disregard of the law, it's still an available ground in New York. Um, but that's the only ground um, for which uh, awards can be reviewed for anything other than these uh, procedural grounds. Manifest disregard is itself, uh, a, I mean, even if it exists at all, um, it's a very narrow criterion for review of an award. Um, the reviewing court must find two things. Uh, again, this comes from Second Circuit decisions about uh, judicial review. Must find first that the arbitrators knew of a governing legal principle yet refused to apply it or ignored it altogether, and that the law ignored by the arbitrators 
was well defined, explicit, and clearly applicable to the case. Now that's a pretty, you put those two things together, that's a pretty restrictive um, uh, criterion for review. And what it means, and the court has said this many times, that a mere error of law, however bad or obvious, that obviously wrong standard in, in the UK, that's not enough in itself. Right? A, uh, an error of law is not enough in itself. Um, you must know what the law is and refuse to do it. Now, the ironic result, I mean, so this is a very peculiarly paradoxical standard, I think, because what it means is that the more difficult the law, the less likely it is that there will be judicial review. Because the more difficult the legal question the arbitrators have to answer, it may just be a mere error of law. Um, so the only cases, the, the more difficult the law, the less likely it is that there will be judicial review. The only cases where there is judicial review is when everybody knows the law already, but the arbitrators refuse to do it. So as you can see, I hope that that standard means that there's not going to be development of the law, because the only cases that get from arbitrators to the court are those where everybody already knows the law. Um, result? Not enough law. Um, many child party arbitrations take place in New York, but the only child party cases the federal courts hear are about ancillary matters, about enforcement, getting security for a claim. You may have heard about will be attachment, uh, but that's, that's the way in which you get security for uh, uh, an arbitration. You can uh, attach, which is like arresting a ship, or you can attach other property to get security for an arbitral award. There are plenty of cases about getting security. Uh, there are cases about incorporation of CP, is child party terms into bills of lading, which is an issue of whether there's a binding arbitration agreement at all. Um, and uh, cases about discovery and enforcement of arbitrators' subpoenas. The Federal Arbitration Act gives arbitrators subpoena powers. So you get these ancillary questions in federal court, but you don't get any cases. Well, any is an exaggeration. Uh, there are very few cases about substantive child party law. Um, go to court uh, in the United States. I'll give you an example here. Um, this example, uh, well, I can describe it to you. It may um, uh, make less sense to you than to an audience of maritime lawyers, but there's uh, a split between the Second Circuit and the Fifth Circuit, meaning that the Second Circuit and the Fifth Circuit take different views. Fifth Circuit is in uh, the South, including New Orleans, where I live. Um, these are the two big maritime circuits, um, Second Circuit and Fifth Circuit. And they have disagreed since 1991 on um, uh, the way to interpret a safe port or safe birth provision in a charter party. The charter uh, standard provision in, a, in charter parties is the charter promises to send the ship only to safe ports or safe berths. The question is, is that an absolute promise that the birth will be safe, or is it merely uh, a promise by the charter to exercise due diligence, you know, to take reasonable care? Why this becomes important is if there is some, some danger at the port or birth that is not apparent, um, uh, couldn't be found with due diligence, but actually then causes damage to the vessel. I was in a, ship, a case recently of a ship that birthed um, at a port called Paulsbury, New Jersey, and there was a, a, a big anchor um, sitting on the bottom of the river that ripped open uh, the bottom of the ship, big oil spill as a result. That case, turns on exactly this point. Is it the promise, an absolute promise by the charter that the port is safe, even though the charter may not know about this anchor, nobody knew that this anchor was there, or is it merely a due diligence promise? I'll do my best, you know, I'll take reasonable care to uh, be sure that the port to which I send you is safe. Now that is, that safe port, safe birth cases, are, that's bread and butter disputes in charter parties. I mean, those kind of disputes arise all the time. Um, the law in the United States has been unclear since 1991. Um, this circuit split has gone unresolved since 1991. The Third Circuit, in the case that I told you about, is now considering the first safe port case since 1991. The first safe port case in a court since 1991. All the others go to arbitration and stay there. To give you another example, another stock standard, um, I have this example in my written paper, not on the screen. Another absolutely standard, almost everyday dispute in voyage charter parties is about lay time and demurrage, about delaying a vessel uh, for longer than you've paid for its use. Um, there have been three reported lay time and demurrage cases in the last 16 years. 
Um, my point is, I, I give you these illustrations to show that the law is, of charter party law is not developing in the United States. And the case book that I use um, to teach my students of two languages, we've got cases in there from the 19th century, because some of the principles have not advanced since the 19th century, because none of, those, uh, none of the charter party disputes get out of our New York arbitration into the court. You may think this is a good thing. I'm just, you know, I'm just descri describing the situation. Now, what about judicial review in Australia and New Zealand? Well, as um, you know, better than I, um, uh, in both Australia and New Zealand, uh, the basis for judicial review is the Uncentral Model Law, uh, Article 34, states that an application for setting aside is the exclusive basis for review of an arbitral award. So, an application to set aside the award is the only basis for review. Uh, the Uncentral Secretariat, uh, Luca will be proud of me for uh, citing the Uncentral Sec Secretariat, uh, describes uh, Article, has this to say about um, Article 34, it says it's an exclusive list of limited grounds. And those grounds are essentially the same as the grounds for refusing recognition and enforcement of foreign awards under the New York Convention. I heard Luke saying that very thing at the end of uh, his lunchtime presentation. Now again, the grounds for review under Article 34 are mostly procedural. Party under any capacity, arbitration agreement invalid, no notice of appointment of the arbitrator, etc., etc. Uh, also, substantive inarbitrability. The subject matter of the dispute is not capable of settlement by arbitration under the law of the state. So if there is to be review under uh, Article 34 uh, for error of law, um, it can only come under 34.2b2. The award is in conflict with the public policy of this state. Uh, which then raises the question, is an award, the making of an award that's legally wrong, is that, would enforcement of that be contrary to the public policy of the state of Campbell City? <laughs> he said, and that's the answer, no. Um, uh, uh, I'll just, and it's no in pretty much everywhere except India. The Supreme Court of India is the only court to have said, well, yes, it might be. And, and I'll, I'll take you on a quick world tour here of this proposition, because I've got 10 minutes left by the look of things. Um, uh, a phrase that's often used, it actually comes from a New York Convention enforcement case, not an uncontrolled model law uh, review case, but this is the phrase that's often used, it's a very famous case, Parsons and Whittemore, and the award will offend against public policy only if it would violate our most basic notions of morality and justice. A deliberate attempt to set the bar pretty high there. Um, the same kind of thing um, from the Ontario Court of Appeal, accordingly to succeed on this ground the award must fundamentally offend the most basic and explicit principles of justice and fairness in Ontario, or evidence intolerable ignorance or corruption on the part of the arbitrary program. Um, the applicants must establish that the awards are contrary to the essential morality of Ontario. One may pause to make a snide joke about whether there is any essential morality in Ontario. Um, uh, Singapore Court of Appeal, the same thing. Um, I, I don't know why I have so many quotations up here. Perhaps most importantly, here in New Zealand, you have the same thing as well. Um, uh, this is a quotation from a, a case called Downhill Joint Venture. The Court of Appeals judgment in this earlier case, Amal Tal, indicates that the words public policy require that some fundamental principle of law and justice must be engaged. There must be some element of illegality or enforcement of the award must involve clear injury to the public good or abuse of the integrity of the court's processes and powers. And then they go on to say, and in this case, we're nowhere near that. Um, so I said, the only court that has said anything, anything more receptive um, about Article 34 um, is the Supreme Court of India. Um, error of law by an arbitral pa panel making to patent illegality. Again, it's still a pretty high standard there. Uh, could be contrary to public policy in India for purposes of uh, the uncentral model law. All of the other jurisdictions, well, I haven't looked at every jurisdiction in the world, that's the kind of thing that Luca does. Um, but um, but uh, review under Article 34, which would be the case in Australia New Zealand, for uh, any panel sitting here, very difficult to get. Possibly impossible. Um, now, just a, uh, I'm going to rattle through these. Um, can the grounds for review be expanded by agreement? So given that it's very difficult to get judicial review, might the parties say, agree among themselves, well actually we want a legally correct uh, resolution of our decision. And if the arbitrators get the law wrong, we agree that we will, that, that there can be, then be judicial review. Can the parties do that? 
Um, uh, Hall Street and Mattel, that's what Hall Street Associates and Mattel was about in the United States. The US Supreme Court says, no, you cannot. This is where the Supreme Court said that the list in the Federal Arbitration Act is the list. And you can't expand by your agreement on what Congress has said the grounds for judicial review are. By the way, the French Court of Cassation has said the same thing. Importantly, for maritime arbitration in England, the answer is yes you may expand the grounds for judicial review. And that's principally because the Act actually says so. Um, what about Article 34? Um, it would be the same question. I mean, in Article 34 jurisdictions like uh, Australia and New Zealand, can you, could you agree to expand the list of, of grounds for review in an Article 34 country? Um, well, Article 34 says only by an application for setting aside in accordance with paragraphs two and three. And an arbitral award may be set aside only if. And that would seem to suggest that the position under Article 34 is the same as in the United States. This is it. This is the list. And you may not expand it by agreement. But the counter-argument, which failed in Wall Street and Mattel, is arbitration is consensual. It's based upon the agreement of the parties. And if the parties have agreed that there can be review for error of law, why not enforce that agreement? That's the counter-argument. Uh, remember again, though, um, the uh, Unsectoral Secretariat's description of uh, uh, Article 34, an exclusive list of limited grounds. And in Australia, the court is actually allowed to look at unsectoral documents in, in, in interpreting the model. Okay, um, uh, can you waive Article 34? Um, yes, well, the Ontario Court of Justice says yes. Um, you can have an exclusion agreement actually precluding judicial review, um, which is kind of the, the you know, if you... If you want there to be no possibility of judicial review, um, uh, you can agree to that, uh, to that effect. Only so the Ontario Court of Justice has held. I don't believe that that question has been answered um, in New Zealand. Um, exclusion agreements, clearly permitted under UK law. Exclusion agreement being there can be no review of the award. Exclusion agreements are permitted, again, says so in the Act, not permitted <coughs> in the United States. You can't, and basically the view in the US is the, the Federal Arbitration Act says when you can get review, you can't do better than that, you can't do worse than that. Um, you can always get review for the grounds in the FAA. So exclusion agreements don't work in the US, they do work in the UK. Okay, conclusion, my conclusion with five minutes to spare. Um, autonomy of arbitral proceedings is an important feature, obviously. I mean, everybody, in the arbitration community agrees with that, and one that is emphasized very much by the answer to model law. Um, the more complete the autonomy, the more important it is to have well-qualified arbitrators, and this is the right, you know, the right place for me to be saying that, right? It's very important to have well-qualified arbitrators, uh, such as those um, in Ammons. Um, but it is possible um, to have too much of a good thing, um, which I believe to be the case in the United States. Um, the, 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 the virtual impossibility of getting judicial review in the United States has indeed stultified the development of charter party law in the United States. Um, the Commercial Court Users Committee in London is beginning to suspect that, and I think the US experience emphatically shows that it is possible to have too much of a good thing. You can argue with it. If all of this is such a bad thing for the maritime community, why is the maritime community here voluntarily submitting disputes to arbitration? Education or using the UK well, option it's of agreeing, not the... or using the UK option of agreeing uh, specifically to permit a review of error. Well, the second point is that you can't do it because the Supreme Court has said in Hall Street and Mattel that you can't agree to have review on error of law. Well, and you can not... in the UK. You can in the UK. Yeah. And of course, yeah. the business is migrating to the UK. Um, but why? Why is? It? I mean, it's not all that bad for maritime lawyers because they get to argue the cases before the. Arbitrators. Right? Um, what they get to argue before the arbitrators is based on really old law in the United States. But you know the, the lawyers are still happy. Um, yeah. It's a, sort of a related question. You were talking about the um, decreasing pool of arbitrators and um, a lot of lawyers being involved in that. Does that mean there's a sort of hidden precedent where the lawyers know? what the arbitrators decide and which ones always decide. Yes. They say, Port means this. Yes. 
that, and, and that's very much how uh, SMA arbitration, arbitrations are done. But the, the ship owner will appoint an arbitrator, the charter will appoint an arbitrator, and then the two will appoint a third. And yeah, there are charters arbitrators, and there are owners arbitrators. They're the ones who get appointed by the owners, and they're the ones who get appointed by the charters. The crucial question is, who's the third? But Martin, the question, first question seemed to be, why doesn't the industry do something about it? Because w when you were explaining what uh, particularly New York arbitration is, it sounded to me like it was more an expert determination right. by a person who works in the industry. Right, that's what it's intended. Th yeah. Those commercial men uh, and one or two women. What do those commercial men or women of the industry think about their own process? Are they happy with it or would they like to get into the judicial system of the US, which I imagine no one does. Well, well no, actually. Um, apart from the lawyers. Yeah, apart from the lawyers. Uh, the answer is um, that it's not clear. I'm sorry, you know, but there's, there's no clear view, and partly because there's so little left of the American ship industry. A lot of the cases that go to arbitration, maritime cases that go to arbitration in New York, are not involving American parties, just like many of the ones that go to arbitration in London are not involving English parties. It's just because the standard form charter parties that are used all over the world have a clause saying arbitration in New York or arbitration in London. That's the very question, isn't it? Why is it that the industry includes that clause? Because, they, uh, because it's incredibly conservative in general terms. Right. Um, you know, if you struck it out and put arbitration in Wellington, mm. um, the other side is going to get very suspicious and think you have. Um, you know, you've got some ulterior motive for doing so, and you probably do. You want to be in Wellington rather than having to go to London to resolve your dispute. And what will happen, uh, any changes to the standard form charter parties tends to uh, be, have, the, have an effect on the negotiation of the freight rate that's charged. And um, people are just, the business is very conservative. I, I agree that it doesn't make any sense. And, and, uh, both Singapore and Milan are trying to sort of, you know, change people's minds. You know, we know how to do maritime law as well. Sure. But I was wondering whether the answer is the disparate interests of the different parties that are involved. Uh, that because not they don't converge really. They don't want to. They can't agree on how they might change it. No, it's not the answer. So everybody <laughs> just sticks with with the way it's always been. Yes. Uh, on the whether New Zealand is considered. Um, whether you can accept <coughs> judicial review. I thought Daniel going straight to his book, but the mechanics. Yes, that's right. There is. Right. Yes, there is. Yeah. 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 Yeah.